on fan. I Go ahead, you. all right. All right, so it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Tony Luge, uh, who is a great friend and a colleague. And he started the same way I did. And we've worked together on a few things. We always, at least we've talked about, about working together on a lot of things. We've never worked together on it. <laughs> we did. You no, know, we haven't published, but yeah. Uh, but yeah, amazing research publications on the physics of viruses. I'll let him take it. Okay, thank you, Parag. Then I'll, if everybody's okay, I'll take the mask off so maybe you can hear me a little bit better. So thank you, everybody. Pleasure to be in person. This is a big, big, big improvement this year. So I'll tell you a little bit um, on the latest updates on a little bit the biophysics and evolution of viruses. And just to make it, why would this matter? Think a little bit on where we are right now. So we have a virus that is about, that in, stores its information in 30,000 letters, all right? And these 30,000 letters in its genome encodes for about 30 words. 30 words is about two sentences. So we have a creature that with two sentences, as soon as it changes a few of the letters on those sentences, was able to jump from infecting bad to infecting humans and causing COVID-19. And as we have been chasing it, it's been changing little by little. And we have always been behind because the physical changes that it has produced on the surface of the virus have been able to keep moving forward and avoiding our strategies. So clearly, and this is an empirical fact, we yet cannot forecast very well what can happen tomorrow with pretty much any virus that is on the world. And since viruses are the most abundant thing on the planet, it's a little bit worse. So what I'm gonna show a little bit is our approach on how to have a framework that we can maybe get a little bit ahead of that. Now, the downside of that framework for prediction of physical properties of viruses is we're not gonna be able to solve coronavirus anytime soon because the viruses that I will be talking are have a little bit higher symmetry, we'll see that. The upside of it is that it's pretty much 90% of the viruses in the world. So down the line, we might be able to cover a fair amount. It's just that some of the usual suspects that we interact with may still be off the book. So let's see if this So we'll do it Something has happened. Okay, now it works. So here's how we're gonna do the talk. I'll divide it in three parts. The first, I'm gonna introduce the generalized quasi equivalence theory of glycosidal architectures. That's a, actually a topic that I presented a year ago online, but we're gonna use it as a framework. Then I'm gonna show how we're using this framework to predict the physical structure of unknown viruses and how we can test that. And the last part will be a little bit the next steps that we're doing, which are involving also process of assembly and emergence of new viruses. So viruses come in all shapes and forms. Here we have some unfortunate usual suspects, HIV. We have influenza, which by the way, is relatively similar to coronavirus from this picture point of view. Uh, the majority of viruses in the world actually look more like this one, and we're going to be working on that a lot. Now, the take-home message in this picture is that one common aspect of viruses, you have the genomic material that has the infective information, the information that's going to generate the particle, it's going to make it infective and replicate. And this genomic material is protected in different ways by a protein that is, is uh, produced multiple times to generate a structure and in some cases, you have a shell, like in this case, and it makes a protein shell that protects the genome inside. In some cases, like coronavirus and influenza, what you have is the protein wraps, in that case, RNA, and then you may have other parts of the virus. In this case, it's a membrane that also protects it outside. But you usually have a protein interacting with the genome in one capacity or another as an outer layer or even directly in contact. And we'll be tracking that because one of the main things of these proteins 
is that when you have an infection on a cell, many of the elements of these viruses come together on a self-assembly process. And that's where the physics starts becoming important to understand how we can pin the evolution of viruses and predict something. Um, for example, you produce multiple copies of these proteins that protect the genome, and the interaction between these proteins are gonna bring them together, and they're gonna form these structures and protect. In some cases, you form the structure first, and then you pack the genome after. Sometimes you do it at the same time. Which means that you don't have a mini robot, a molecular robot putting pieces together like a Lego. You have that encoded already in the proteins. And then you need enough concentration of proteins, enough in certain conditions, so you could trigger those self-assembly processes. And that's one of the ways we're going to try to target, um, or it's one of the key points of the approach. So um, one key aspect of these proteins, so if you divide the virus sphere based on the proteins that protect the genome, there is something quite remarkable. There is about 18 different types of these proteins that have been characterized. And that's not obvious because viruses are extremely divergent. They mutate very quick. And even viruses that are apparently similar may have pretty much no sequence similarity. And in many cases, they don't have sequence similarity between the proteins. But this protein seems to adopt an organization, a 3D structure that is very resilient. So even if you change the sequence of these proteins, when you group them by viruses, each group of viruses seems to have a preference. And that kind of folding, it's maintained and conserved regardless on how many adaptations the viruses do. In particular, 10 out of these 18, 18 capsid folds, capsid protein folds, form icosahedral structures, which are the ones that we're going to focus. That represents 60% of the viral families, which is this piece of the pie. And it represents about 90% of the viruses on the planet. And actually, the most abundant one of them, the viruses that look like a lunar lander, tail bacteriophages, use a major capsid protein that adopts this fold that is called the H canary 7 fold. And this represents 50 to 90% of the viruses when you get like a sample of water or you get a sample of your poop or you spit, you're going to have that many of those. So we're going to focus a lot on this as our working system. But many of the ideas that I'm going to introduce could be extended to any other element in this path. Right. Where the SARS scope do? Yes, so the SARS-CoV-2, you have the corona nucleocapsid like yes. protein. That's where you would have them. You probably would, I mean, this, this is a library problem. The more you sequence, the more families you have. So this is a pie that I actually started putting on 2017 from this publication. And we would have to update it because this corona like now is going to expand a little bit because we have so many sequences of it. By the way, if you have any questions during the talk, of course, stop me anytime. So what are the physical mechanisms that select these capsid protein folds? Why are they so resilient? Why something that has evolved since the origin of life and that it's so abundant in the planet is so focused on not changing, on not changing these 3D structures and do anything but change it, right? So one answer or one way to approach it is icosahedral capsids provide multiple biophysical advantages. So at least for those cases, those 10 cases that form mycosidal structures, we might have some biophysical insights on it. And that relates to some of the work that I've done before. So one is if you take building blocks, this is the number of building blocks, and you compare how well building blocks would interact with each other with simple interactions, what you observe thermodynamically, this is a, the chemical potential is that as you go, as you increase the number of building blocks, the structures that form icosahedral symmetries seem to be particularly well, doing very well thermodynamically, which means that if you wait long enough, that would be the structure that would emerge around those numbers of building blocks if you are putting them together in a size that they fit. So here we have some with 12, this one will have more 72. So if you, it depends on the curvature that you have, you're going to select those. And not only the icosahedral, you actually have variations of it. 
you can elongate them and they're also very uh, stable. They're very um, competitive thermodynamically. So they exclude other structures because these are the ones that satisfy the energy minima the best. And you actually find about 20% of viruses forming these types of structures. Okay, so thermodynamically, they're good. Kinetically, they're also very good because think this way. I mean, if you take any object here, the thermodynamic equilibrium of pretty much any object in this place is to fall apart and just be spread through the universe. So that means that many of the thermodynamic solutions are not kinetically accessible. You have to wait forever. But what it turns out with icosahedral structures, so here are some simulations on if you keep increasing the size of the shell and you put the proteins one by one, it turns out that the ones that form icosahedral symmetries are the ones that will have a wider range of radii. So that means that they're gonna even be able to outcompete other structures. They're not only good thermodynamically, if you leave them enough time to form, they're actually gonna form more likely than other structures. So they're kinetically also more stable. And then there is a mechanical aspect of it. So early in the 50s, it was already proposed when they started having evidence of icosahedral symmetry and viruses, that an icosahedron, and here other platonic solids that were proposed, is the shape that if you want to put the same protein many times, is gonna give you the maximum surface per volume, which is a good payoff because that means you encode one gene and you get as much, as much volume as possible, sorry, as much volume per surface, which means that you can store a lot of information for very little cost. One aspect that wasn't proposed there, but we investigated a few years ago, is that it's not only that it gives you a, a genomic advantage, it's that it also gives you a mechanical advantage because icosahedral structures, compared to other regular structures, are going to be the most spherical. And that reduces the stress, the mechanical stress that you accumulate in the places that you need to accommodate the fact that you have a curvature. And what happens is that if you do relatively small structures, they tend, turn, tend to form spheres. And as they get bigger, they flatten and make these more flattened icosahedral shapes. If you try to do this with these other structures, as you go bigger, you're gonna accumulate so much stress that usually they just fall apart. So that means that these particular icosahedral structures help viruses to be able to explore or well, at least that would be the mechanical inference, many different sizes, because they can actually remain stable as you grow, All right? Yes. Can you tie these structures back to the protein pole that you were showing in the previous one? Because you're showing spheres here. And I'm like, yeah, so let me pay Parag for that question, because that's exactly what I was gonna <laughs> say now. Bottom line of this, online of what Parag was saying, this tells us, why may be so prevalent that we have icosahedral viruses around in the world? They seem to do very well in different aspects, but doesn't tell us why would you have 10 protein types that do that? Why, why do you have 10? Why wouldn't you have 1,000? If, if viruses are so eager to be efficient, replicating, why wouldn't you just choose the best one? So that's a little bit where it enters the geometry of it. it, it no? Yes. Always spherical or flat? Can it be like a ring, like left, red blood cells kind of thing? So these ones that do icosahedral yes. structures are on the range between purely spherical and very flat. And sometimes you, you have in between, you have a sphericities, but you don't, you're not gonna see them what it's called pleomorphic. So when you look at influenza or stomatitis virus, you sometimes have even protein shells that seem a little bit like the form, those don't usually have such a strong high high symmetry. They're a little bit more fluid or close to fluid. So that's why they don't get that. I mean, those would get those shapes, the ones that are polymorphic, but not these ones. They can get elongated, but they would be like looking like rigidly elongated, not something that will change shape. So what happens is, in the 50s, and you have to understand, every time you have a new technique, you look at the world in a different way. In the 30s, we have electron microscopy. Oh, that's how viruses look like. Some shape that looks maybe like a ball, like a soccer ball, not even that, like something that looks like a sphere or an 
or a tube. In the 50s, you have X-ray and you start getting evidence that there is a causal symmetry in many of these things that were infecting all viruses. And they said, hmm, causal symmetry, you need 60 proteins because you have an icosahedron, 20 triangles. The protein is asymmetric. If I plug three of these proteins in one phase, I have three proteins there, 20 phases, 60 proteins. And then you can recover the symmetry, you're good. What happens, first virus that gets reconstructed, which X-ray has 180 proteins. So they're like, okay. Casper and Clark introduced the cl classic quasi-equivalence theory. And they were very clever. They said, okay, let's skin this problem in this way. Why, if instead of thinking on 3D, we think about the possible ways you can organize proteins on a plane and then wrap this structure on a 3D surface, and that at least will give us a way to count how many ways maybe we can build like a stable structure. So that's what you have here. They said, okay, let's put the proteins on an hexagonal lattice, which will optimize the interactions between the proteins. And then let's map it into an ecosahedron, which you just need to lay out 20 triangles on this lattice. And you have many options because you just need to choose where you're gonna place the vertex, but you need to place the vertex in hexagonal lattice so you don't break any protein. So that way you have all the proteins in one place. <clears throat> you do that, you introduce 12 of the vertices that you need for the icosahedron, and you can wrap, and you can nicely have an icosahedron. Consequence of this, they get a stoichiometry formula for how many proteins can you have on a capsid. This is what really made this theory skyrocket in the 60s and later on, because chemists and other people that were not that interested on going on the map, they were like, well, I have 60 proteins, I have 180 proteins, I have whatever I can get that is a multiple of 60, I know that I can label it. So that's what happened. They said, oh, look, these are the first elements of this solution. T1 has 60 proteins, T3 is the next solution, 180, T4, 240, and so forth. All right, what happens? Well, time goes by, especially after cryo EM that we have a bigger ability to have structures, many of them don't fit this Casper and Kluge theory. So why so many don't fall that? And this is a problem that we solved with Professor Tuero in University of Connecticut recently, and it's what sets our foundation. The point is that if you want to build an ecosahedron, clearly it seems that you need this hexagonal lattice where you're gonna introduce the vertices, the pentamers that are gonna help you close it but you don't need to do it just with one hexagonal lattice. You can look at any lattice that embeds an hexagonal sublattice and you'll be able to do the same. So among all possible mathematical lattices that have an embedded hexagonal sublattice, you have four that have a particularly interesting property. These four are part of the Archimedean lattices and one characteristic is they have one vertex and they're built with polygons that are regular which is very little information. I'm just giving you the information of one vertex and I know how to build a whole structure. So from a protein virus point of view, it means that if I coordinate the protein and I select it so they can get around this vertex, I'm essentially giving the minimum information that I need to generate multiple icosahedral structures. Of course, you have different types, the hexagonal, trihexagonal, now you have to deal with minor proteins here, snap hexagonal, rhombic 3x. This one just add minor proteins that you need to incorporate, but you can do the same. Yes. So your proteins are sitting at the centers of the hexagon or your proteins are at the vertices? Of the so that's something that I will address at the end because one of the things that we're doing is how are actually the proteins sitting on those. In the short time, what we're gonna agree on is that cluster of proteins need to be forming one of these styles. So in your, in your, in this case, because we're covering the surface, the proteins we're expecting to form this excimer or this trimer or whatever is the shape. However, you have a bunch of other structures that are open that what they do, and actually today we had a talk uh, from a visitor that we have interviewing, Ferrara, Dr. Ferrara, that she actually was working with DNA and she actually was using the edges of some of these structures. So if you do to dodecines and other type of 
molecular complexes, you're going to be working on the edges. All right. Now, there is one last trick that we need. OK, this is cool, but you need to add other proteins, not only the major one, but also the minor. Turns out that you can do a dual transformation of these lattices. Essentially, you take the centers of these polygons and you join them. And then you get a unique tile. And this is very cool for the virus point of view because you have a tile that is able to cover this hexagonal space that you have, which means that if you manage to fit the proteins in any of these four tiles that I'm listing here, you'll be able to build ecosystem structures nicely. So that's a very good compromise. It says, well, just get your shit together to make a tile, and then you're good to go. In these other cases, like, well, you're going to have to coordinate with some other elements, but you can do it as well. It might have its own effect. Make sense? So just a few examples to show why this helps us at least categorize the structures that are there and build on it. These are two classic cases, 180, 60 times T means three, T3. Now you have a theory that tells you that two viruses have a T3, but these two viruses don't look alike. I mean, yes, they have 180 proteins, but if you have a theory that you cannot distinguish two viruses that are organizing the proteins differently, it doesn't really help you move far. With the new framework, at least we know that they're organizing the proteins in the tiles, and this answers a little bit visually what Parag was asking. So this one does a triangular, it's a hexagonal dual. This one's a ROM, it's a trihexagonal tri dual. So you start getting a better framework on how to classify the virus and start in the model. What are the different colors? The different colors are different proteins that actually sit in different quasi-equivalent positions. So anyway, we can get on that, but yes, that would be the answer. Different quasi-equivalent positions, and this is the generalized version. There is another element here, a couple of like especially Zika virus. It's like, well, you don't need to have the protein sitting actually in the hexagonal lattice the way Casper and Cook thought. And these were funny because for a long time people were like, oh, viruses with 120 proteins, that's a T2, but you cannot build a T2 mathematically. So it's like for a long time everybody was fighting in the conferences. And the answer is like, there is no problem if you're working with the new framework, because in this framework, for example, if you have a ROM, the ROM needs to have twofold symmetry, and that would allow you to construct the icosidal structure. But you can build a ROM from proteins having two times n proteins. So I can have two proteins, I can have four proteins, I can have six proteins, I can have eight proteins, I can keep going up, and I would still be able to form the structure. So these are two examples with four. So this one has two proteins, the minimum that you need. This one has four proteins, two dimers. And this one has six proteins, three dimers. Now, why wouldn't you go higher on this? Well, at some point you're so big that you're not gonna be able to assemble the structure efficiently. You're gonna wait, you're gonna be too heavy and your diffusion is gonna be so slow that you're not gonna be able to use the thermal energy that you have inside your host to get close enough with another protein. So there is a certain physical limit and that's where I'm going. We're trying to be in what are the physical constraints. But the bottom line is mathematically now we don't have any problem with these. They're called non-quasi-equivalent structures, but they fall nicely on our new. This is the one that actually started the whole thing. I was starting tail phages. And I found this one, it's like, eh, that's funny, it has these minor proteins, but nobody's talking about them. And then you pull the trigger from there, it's like, oh, herpes actually, which is evolutionary related to tail phages, or it is not, it has H97 fall, double standard DNA, blah, 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 blah. Bottom line, you have a whole family of viruses with H97 fold that seems to have a strong preference, or at least engage a lot on these trihexagonal lattice that had not been really explored before. Bottom line is, oh, well, that gives us a little bit what Parag was asking before. Now we have kind of at least a guide. It looks like you need to do some shapes. Based on those shapes, you're going to be able to build ecosystem structures. So you put one and one together and say, could it be that if you have different folds, you might be building your ecosystem structure differently? Sorry. And that's a little bit what what we started to explore and say it, there seems to be some analogy. It's not exactly one-to-one, -one. it's a little bit more complex than what at the beginning we thought, but it's, it's definitely the right direction. There is another element into it, 
it looks like once you have a certain flow and you're organizing things in one way, you usually have a very specific way of either packing or releasing your genome to the host, which means that there is a very strong connection between how are you going to assemble your capsid and pack your genome in? Are you going to co-assemble? Are you going to assemble afterwards? And how are you going to release that genome? And that seems to be also intimately related to the selection of this form, which makes sense. So in certain ways, you have to build a puzzle, a 3D puzzle, and put those things together. That's constraining the shape that you're going to have. And on top of that, you need to interact with the main thing of the virus, the genome. That's constraining in some capacity how you're going to do that efficiently. Okay? So that's why we got uh, NSF grant to investigate this. And the bottom line is we can start predicting the physical structure of viruses directly from the genome. So that's the key element. That relates to a drop of knowledge in a sea of viruses. Why? We have about hundreds of molecular structures resolved that we have molecular like three to 10 Armstrong resolution. We, we have about tens of thousands of viruses that we can grow in the lab, that you can plug them and say, oh, there is a cell here, I can produce the viruses and I can sequence them and get the genome information of this virus and some pictures like this one here. Through sequencing technologies, now you can assess that in the world, actually, there are many more viruses and you have evidence or we have evidence of millions of different types of viruses because we can read their sequences and say, oh, this shit doesn't look like what we have here. They look much different. That thing is there. Maybe it's the next coronavirus. Maybe it's the next thing. If you make an estimate on then how many species you actually have, because we are not sequencing yet the whole planet, we have between 10 to the 10, 10 to the 20, kind of a big range. And if you count the number of particles, which you can do with some estimates through fluorescence, you have 10 to the 31 particles right now in the planet and big turnover. That's seven orders of magnitude more viruses right now than stars in the galaxy, uh, stars in the universe, sorry. Seven orders of magnitude more of those. Imagine the amount of possibilities and combinatorics and sequences that are being exchanged as we speak. So here's the trick. How do we get access to these unknowns? Well, it would be great if we can at least predict the structure from the genomic information, because that's what we can right now access the most. So how do we do that? So, well, that's like the physics approach. Okay, let's go and let's study the physics that we, that the ones that we can see. Let's see if we have some principles there that we can maybe think that can hold together so we can expand it and start predicting things that we don't know. So this is one of the case study problems that we're doing on that. The HK97 fall forms shells that pack DNA and make viruses, including tail phages, herpes, archaea tail viruses. And they, funny enough, don't start at T1, the smallest one, possible. They started T4. That's the one that we have structural evidence about. It's also the only fold that we know that makes protein compartments in bacteria, in cells actually, bacteria and archaea, and that it forms a very similar structure to the virus. Funny enough, it makes the smaller ones. So we don't know really what's the origin. It started like this and went to a virus, or it started a virus and it went down. The bottom line is that HK97 fold is capable of making these smaller capsids. So then the question is, and here we have, this is the HK97 fold. There is an alpha domain that goes inside this cluster. And here you have the same alpha domain. You have a peripheral domain that gets placed here in the interstice. And you can see that they also nicely fit into the size. In the same size, they're pretty much the same, both viruses and the encapsulates, these molecular reactors. Uh, but we're missing these ones on the viruses. Now, the question is, do they exist among viruses? Here we have a good target. Now it's like, okay, we have a lot of evidence that these can build the structures. So are those viruses out there and we have not found them? That's the question. Yes. But if you look at that, and then you had the, initially you had those energy curves, uh -huh. right? Won't those fall higher up on those energy curves? And so then the energy argument plays a bigger role. Yes. So that's a, so what Parag, let me see, is 
it, technically, thermodynamically, these ones are not as favorable as this. One way to see it is these ones are closer to a plane where you have as many proteins coordinated with each other. You have six neighbors. So that gives you as much interaction energy as possible. So thermodynamically bigger, from a physics point of view, you'll go bigger just because that's where you have better chemical potential if you have enough proteins and you make it accessible. So that's true. Kinetically, however, and combinatorically, and you can think entropically, it's very likely that you're going to start here because these structures actually are much more likely to make the wrong angle and still form. While these structures, as soon as you make a small mistake in the assembly process, it's like, you can think it this way. If I shoot there and I make a small angle, I'm going to maybe deviate a little bit. If I'm shooting a kilometer away from here and I make, I make the, sm the same mistake, the bullet is going to go like farther on the right or on the left, depends on where I'm pointing. So that's a little bit the same problem with the capsids. As soon as you make a small mistake, you're going to shoot for a radius that you're not expecting. So it's much harder to control. You need to have scaffolding proteins and you need to start paying on other elements that will guarantee that you're gonna make the right structure. Does that make sense? So there is some trade-offs there. Thermodynamically it favors, kinetically you start getting in trouble and trouble. How do we find them? Or how do we propose that we can find them and test it? So we study the structures. We use tools like Chimera. We can analyze the radii, the surface, the volumes, and here is, what we found when we studied 23 of these structures that we have in high resolution. The genome density of these viruses is relatively conserved. Good, that we knew. So it was just quality control. About 0.5 base pairs per nanometer cube. That's the highest density of DNA that you're gonna find in any organism. So it's pretty cool that these viruses are actually so good storing information. The other element that we found that was conserved is that if you look at the external surface of the major capsid protein that get exposed on the capsid, that seems to be conserved across different sizes. So once you have constant surface, constant density, you can propose a scaling model and say, okay, so I have a genome. The genome times the density will give me a volume. The volume, because I have a spherical, quasi-spherical structure, will give me the size. And since the surface of the protein, and I know that they coordinate on an icosahedron, that's going to give me a relationship with the T number, which is three halves. That's the scaling that you have, volume per surface. You do the man, I mean, you do the empirical analysis, the black circles are the structures that we analyze. Of course, they don't go below T4. And we obtain an exponent of 1.47. And I developed the theory a little bit farther to justify also why you get this value here and make things check, but I'm not going to go over that today. The bottom line, and this is something that if you're doing machine learning, you need to be careful. Statistical learning, machine learning, a linear regression is one of the first approaches you can do. If you do inference, what you have in between here, you might be very confident about it. What you have as, as an extrapolation, there you need to be a little bit more careful. In our case, we know what we're being held accountable. We're saying, if the genome remains constant, the genome density, if the external surface of the protein remains constant, here's where we expect to find these structures. So at least we have how big the genome length would be, and we also have the sizes. So that means that we have empirical things, I'm sorry, predictions that are empirically measurable, either on genome length, so these are the different structures that we're missing, or on capsid size. In parentheses, you have the 95% conflict. All right, so we know where to shoot. How do we try to find them empirically? So we did it two ways. You have more ways, but that's the two ways that we explore. One is you go on the viruses that have been isolated, because those you can grow, you can sequence, and you have the genome. So once you identify those that are on the group that we're interested, tail phages that do this H canary 7 fold, we can investigate their genome lengths and identify where do they usually form the structures. And when you apply the model, because these are 3,348 and we started with 23, all right? 
these are the ones that we at most have a picture, but not much molecular information. And you can see that the majority form T7s. That's not a surprise. We knew that. And we start seeing that oh, we have six candidates that can form a T3. So that is already a starting point on missing a gap that we have right now. We only have up to T4. Now we can shoot for six isolated ones that we can actually grow. We can put in the cryo electron microscopy and try to see that it forms the right structure. We also found that, yeah, you have a lot of bigger ones that are not very well characterized, but you see them when you look at the isolates. So there is other gaps that we have in our knowledge because we haven't produced as many structures on that end. Not gonna enter there. But yeah, I want to say, yeah, still missing a bunch there. So how do we find that extra piece? Or how can we find it? Well, let's go to the sequences that are out there that we cannot even grow. And I was lucky enough that a former PhD student, well, now Dr. Bangler, um, moved to the NCBI in NIH in BC, Bethesda. And he was working with a bunch, he was putting together a bunch of sequences that people had done, had sequenced from the human guy. And then he was assembling all the sequences to see if there were any viruses there. And I say, hey, Sean, can I have a look at your data and see if we can find some of these creatures that I'm interested on? He's like, okay but you'll get me some new problems. Good. So I get that and we focus on assembled genomes that target the tail phages. So we have some markers that tells us, yeah, this smells like the viruses that you're interested. And then we have direct terminal repeats. That is a trick that we use bioinformatically to sometimes, it's an assumption that tells you that your genome might be complete, all right? Because some viruses have this direct terminal repeat at the end of their genome, and that gives you a signal that maybe that's complete, which means that we're biased because not all viruses do that, but at least we have something to fish on. So you do the same spectral analysis on the genome length, you have a density distribution, similar picture, there is an extra pic here, and the, funny, the good thing for us is now we have evidence of even smaller ones, so before we got it to three, now we have many trees, and now we're starting to get these small ones that are missing. And remember, this might hold the key of, this is one of the most ancient viruses, I didn't mention that, one of the most ancient viruses in the planet. And it means that it might hold a lot of information about how life evolved because it's right on the edge of making protein shells for bacteria and archaea and making viruses. So it's actually a very important niche to find these structures and see what they do. Now, the funny thing is we got this strong signal that we didn't see among isolates around T12. So it's also another way to generate what structures are actually out there that we're actually missing in our, in our like, libraries. And the funny thing is many people were pointing out to a new type of virus that is actually one of the most frequent among humans, that is crassphage, that actually was first discovered here in SDSU. And the structural analysis points to the same direction. It says, oh, there is a bunch of these viruses that were not known before that seem to be actually very abundant among humans. So go bigger, go home. No, it's like, well, that's the human. Let's go to the rest of the planet. So I gave a call to these two folks, Simon Wu and Stephen Knife, I got the Joint Genome Institute because they're putting together sequences across the world and actually are trying to reduce the bias from the medical side of it. We did the same analysis, take the genome, take the data from different environments, look at those that are circular through the eye terminal repeats, Make sure that you have some markers that you think that you're targeting the right virus and do the spectral analysis on the genome line. And boom, finally, we find candidates of T1. This is the one that was missing that we couldn't find anywhere else. So that's just the way we're approaching it. And now here is the challenge. Now it's like, okay, among isolates, you can grow it. But among these ones, how can you actually find them, no? And here is what we're trying to do. And this is a collaboration with Simon Wyatt at the University of Connecticut. He has a cryo-electron microscopy. He loves the structures, but to see them actually. And what we're trying to do is let's pick the isolates. That's easy because you can grow it. But let's pick also these small candidates. And they're small enough that you can generate a plasmid, plug it inside a bacteria, grow it inside the bacteria, even if it's not the right host. You don't care about making it infective. You're just trying to make sure that you can produce the proteins and assemble the capsid. And that's a little bit the strategy that we're following. 
we have some preliminary results that at least we can produce the proteins, but that's the direction that we're going. Another direction that we're not going to discuss today is we're actually learning how to assemble these proteins in vitro, so you don't even need the bacteria whatsoever, because the structures are so small that we actually have a good chance to produce them in different ways. And that's the way we're going to validate all these predictions that I'm showing. Now, here's the challenge. I'm relying on viruses that we can kind of circularize. That means that they're kind of complete. But the majority of viruses that we're having evidence out there, they only have pieces of the genome. So we cannot rely on just having the full genome. We need to go a little bit farther. So how do we do that? And this is a recent paper that I analyzed as a candidate, candidate in the program. So what we did is let's take the viruses that we know that at least are isolated. We have their genomes, good. We can identify in some of them the major capsid proteins bioinformatically, or sometimes you have experiments. We did it for 635. We apply our model, so we have the architecture predicted, and now we have the protein. Okay, I missed this part. We focus on the protein that makes the capsid because you say, well, if you're planning to predict an architecture, let's focus on the building. No? So if I cannot have the whole genome, at least I can focus on the thing that it's building it, and maybe I can get some information out of it. This protein, after all, is selected to make this architecture. So she generates a library, and now she does some machine learning. No? Other piece of the story, we have no clue how this protein is able to do the different architectures yet. We're working on that. So we did some proximity matrix, meaning similarity. That's good. It gives you about 75% accuracy with this data set. The downside of it, the proteins diverge so quick that many of the viruses that you would find out there, you would have no similarity to compare to. So then we did another approach that is amino acid composition. So you count the frequency of amino acids in the protein. You take the length of the protein and the isoelectric point. So you have 22 features. And then you train, in this case, we did random forest because it's a cheap and quick solution for most of these problems until you have millions of data that you can do much um, neural nets or other approaches. So we did that and we got 75% accurate predicting directly from the major capsid protein. Of course, not the, all the architectures are as good because we don't have them as well represented here. So we cannot train them equivalently. And we did a projection how good are we going to get if we were able to work on a bigger size data set? And what we predicted, it increased logarithmically. So if you give me 2,500, a library of 2,500 data points, we might be able to get 90% accurate. And actually, Diana, this was on the follow-up project, just confirmed that I think that she got 85% when she was trying this size. So it looks on the right direction. So we apply this again to show that now we can go directly to the sequences. We don't need to make them complete. We can find the protein bioinformatically. We apply our models. And now we have, for the first time, a way to monitor high throughput, whatever structures these viruses may be doing out there at any place. I mean, this is the proof of concept, 75% accuracy on the protein, you know, but we had 0% before. So it's pretty good in my point of view. Of course, we don't see small ones because in this data set, we didn't have small ones. We're trying to fix that. That's part of, and we didn't see any surprise. No, strong T7s, some small ones, and some jumbo phages, which actually are not even easy to see from the circularized genomes because it's very hard to get a giant genome that you put the pieces randomly together. But if you have information about the protein, you might be able to say, well, there is a creature that is big. It's like seeing one, you know, like, um, I know, I'm not gonna get the word in English, a huella. You have like, you step on something and you see, oh, there was a dinosaur here a million years ago. We can see that through the protein, right? What was that? Footprint. Footprint, footprint. yeah. That's a good thing about. <laughs> so we're gonna close with this quickly. Not gonna say too much. The problem with these approaches is they're slightly based on physics, but they're a lot based on inference. So how can we get better? If to get better, you need to put more physics in it. That, at least that's my approach. So Colin Brown is a master in physics, developed um, a tool in Chimera X so you can compare the structures. And now you can generate all these nice 3D structures so you can compare the viruses and you can start doing things more like what Parag was asking before. And Diana was 
coordinating the lab on this. So you can start looking at how the proteins actually organize nicely on the lattice or not. And what you start seeing is that, well, first of all, this was something that we were not that aware and the people have not been that explicit. The building blocks have been for a long time, especially in the modeling community, model as bricks. You put a brick next to another and you're gonna make a shell. Turns out that when you start looking at it closely, many of them seem to be forming more like scales. So you actually slide on each other and that gives you a degree of freedom that we'll see that makes the first mechanism that we have to modify the size of the virus. So this is one observation that we did. We compared these two structures. One is an hexagonal, this is a trihexagonal. And what we see is that you see the excimer here from the back, it looks like sliding, like you have scales on top of each other. But now when you look at these other structures, they're flat. And that's interesting because before we were like, okay, these viruses need to figure out how to jump from one architecture to the next, good luck change some amino acid things, jump, you get a bigger volume, figure out how you're gonna fill up that volume. There is many things that need to happen at the same time. This gives you a completely different approach. It says, well, that might still work, but you have for the first time a continuous mechanism that you say, well, I can change a little bit my interactions and slide out, slide out, slide out until I get flat and you have transitioned from this structure to this structure you could have transitioned from those in an incremental way, which is something that we had absolutely no clue, and this is still like preliminary results. So that's exciting because it gives us mechanistic ways to actually predict why would we expect to have certain things. And the other part I wanted to emphasize before finishing is you have the assembly process. So this is Brandon Ricafrenti in Master of Physics. And you can do it with master equation. You can do some theory to calculate the binding interactions, how long it takes to dissociate them. You need to introduce a free energy model for the capsid formation, but eventually you can simulate how long is it gonna take to form a capsid? Is it reasonable that I predict that a protein makes a capsid and then it takes 10,000 years? It's like, that doesn't make any sense. So this tells us based on the binding energy between the proteins, how big are the proteins? How many proteins can you produce? How long is it going to take you? And one of the answer and one of the insights on this is that it predicts that you have a sweet spot. If you're too weak, you get interactions and you disassemble. If you're too strong, you form too many of these partial capsids and you deplete the proteins and you cannot form the big one quickly. So just from a kinetic point of view, it says you have a sweet spot as a protein that you want to interact weak enough that you don't deplete proteins, but strong enough that you don't fall apart as you're trying to form. So we're working with Rhys Garman because this is MS2, which is a virus that he's growing and working in vitro. So hopefully we'll have cooler results on that. And the last thing I want to say, how did we got to get this much viral types in the world? One way, coronavirus, like that's what we see, it changes little by little and it fucks up with our lives. The other way, influenza, recombination of spikes. You have a virus that comes from a bird, a virus that comes from a pig, influenza-like in both cases, they get on the same place, they recombine, they actually take pieces of each other and suddenly you have a new spike that has epitopes that are different and that are gonna fuck you up in a different way. That's more seasonal, no? This recombination part is not very well understood. And one can think, how can new viruses maybe emerging because of this recombination that we have not thought too much? And one thing that we have thought about it, and for this part of the guilty, is that some of these smaller structures that I talked that are not icosahedral, they actually could be very feasible to make. As far as you're big enough to hold your genome in it, there is nothing against not being icosahedral. You're just not gonna be able to scale up that well, but you might still have a small protein that can make a structure that is not icosahedral, but tetrahedral or hedral. And as far as it can fit its own genome, you have a generator of new viruses because it's so accessible kinetically that you might be able to just be generating them and then you can recombine them with other things. Maybe. And that's uh, a project that we have going with Boris, Anka Segal, and Rob Edwards. And we do similar techniques and some of the assembly, and we have this Gordon and Barrymore Foundation that we just got. 
And well, that just to close some of the people that I mentioned throughout the talk on the student side, and then there are other people involved in it that I had been mentioning through. We have a couple of grants supporting this. We're recurring student and positive. That's an open door always. And thank you very much for your attention. I'll take any questions in just a minute. Questions? Let's see if it's zooming. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Excellent talk. I love it. You did mention that uh, you put, you already said that you're working with particular virus, so mm -hmm. you have policy teams as well. And you also mentioned that there are so many other virus. Your technique can be extended and apply. And you did mention it with the number of times. I'm just curious in the influenza, like if you are looking for the structure of the virus, like influenza, main piece is missing here. Is uh, you are just consider proteins only. There's no lipid bilayer. And also hydrophobicity of the part of the protein, those all things play the huge roles in the structure of the protein mm -hmm. and also projection and the can it be extended? Or well, yeah. So theoretically, yes, it can be extended. You just need to be adding what are the constraints that you would expect physically. The problem is the amount of like the how easy it is to constrain the possibilities, it gets more complicated. Starting with the fact that the lipid bilayer is fluidic and you will, when you put the proteins, it gets a little bit more rigid, but that adds a degree, an element of degrees of freedom. And that's why it's promising because if we focus on structures that are highly symmetrical, since the majority are like that, we can do a lot. But um, yeah, it's not that easy to extend it. And then there is another issue. These tail phages are extremely diverse. You have very different structures, which means that it's a very good model system because with very little information, you can connect very different sizes. But then you have a bunch of viruses that are icosahedral that they only make like T1s and T3s, which means that the amount, the theory that you need to develop in that case need to be much more refined for you to be informative because the differences that you're gonna see between the viruses are very nuanced on the structure, no? So I would say I took the one that is the easiest case. If you think about it is, I get this one right, I get 90% of the viruses in the planet right, you know? Yeah. But many of the concerning viruses for different reasons are um, like Ebola. It's a minor virus in terms of number, but pretty brutal. HIV, influenza, coronavirus, they're not icosidal. So it's not that obvious how we're gonna do that jump. What is clear is that the fact that you have this protein full so conserved, it means that you are selected there physically for so many steps. How do you fold the protein? How do you need to interact with the other proteins? The nice thing of the ecosystem structures is that it provides us a nice puzzle to constrain the shape. Now, how do you constrain your shape if you're making these bizarre structures? Now, that part, I would say, yeah, we'll do it in the next five years. <laughs> okay. Tony? Yeah. Tony? I thought I was trying to get an order of magnitude ocean. Of Tony? Oh, no. How many of these? Wait, wait, there is a ghost. I think it's Peter. Oh, it is I. <laughs> it's a dumb question, but uh, I should have asked it much earlier, although I wasn't hooked up properly. Somebody didn't let, allow me to enter. But um, what's T? Well, that's my bad. I should have been more explicit about it. It actually relates to a question that we got before that is the number of colors. So you can calculate T in different ways, but the, the easiest way that people thought at the beginning is your proteins in the hexagonal lattice are immediately related to each other. You put this protein here, you apply the symmetries of the lattice and you can recover them. But as soon as you put them in the virus and they're not a T1, this protein that sits here, and this one is a T3, you will have these proteins that sit in this hexagon, you're not gonna be able to apply the symmetries and recover this one here. That's why they call quasi equivalents because you need, in this case, three different proteins to build a structure. So the T in the classic version of the T is the number of proteins that are occupying different quasi equivalent positions, which means I give you those proteins, three, you apply icosahedral symmetry, 
and you want to recover the structure. If you want to look at it from a more visual point of view, it relates to the question that, that Naveen asked later about the colors. So these colors are actually related to those quasi-equivalent positions and it tells you the T number. The problem with these non-quasi-equivalent versions is the whole thing of the T being the quasi-equivalent, it starts breaking apart. Does that answer your question, Peter? No, I think that adds to my confusion. I feel better about the confusion, though. Um, <laughs> All the other letters were taken. That's why oh, T. Yes. So <laughs> the funny story is, uh, I don't I, T triangulation number. That's where the letter T comes from. No, like no, no, no. But but so now, is it a well-defined quantity or isn't it? And so, how, never mind its historic origin no, 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 what the so, fuck does it mean so it was a well-defined quantity in the 60s and we actually by doing the extension we have kind of messed it up because t what is for sure what is well defined is just a surface it's telling you how much surface you have with respect to your major capsic protein from a quasi from a crystal point of view, it used to tell you how many proteins do you need to put to recover applying acrocytal symmetry to your structure. Now we're kind of in between because the T means surface. So it's not exactly the number of quasi-equivalent proteins that you need. So we, some of the properties of the T remain the same, which is a proxy for the surface of your structure. But some of the crystal properties of the T will need to be revised and maybe get another letter. And that's kind of on the pipeline. So we messed it up a little bit. All right. Well, I didn't say that in the paper. I yeah, I still feel a little confused, but thank you okay. for the def valiant effort. Yes. So the bottom line, my question was: How many base pairs pose for a typical intermediate space? So depends on the virus, but you will have typically between two hundred and three hundred amino acids which means that you're talking about 1,800 base pairs. So usually the rule of thumb is 1,000 base pairs is a protein. Many of these proteins are on the order of 300. Now you start looking at them at it in detail and some of them are 100 something amino acids and some of them are 400 amino acids, but that gives you a ballpark on the order of 1,000. And before when I was talking about coronavirus, we say, 30,000 characters, 30,000 bases, 30 words, 30 proteins. That's usually like the, the equivalent. On the order of 300 amino acids, many proteins work there. Some of them are 100, but that's the typical. But I mean, you see what you're saying, you mean all 30,000 base pairs just to make the capsid protein? No, you only need, depends on the virus, you need just the major capsid protein and you just need to make many copies of it. You only need 1,000 bases. And that will give you the building block that you need to make the structure. What happens in reality is that many viruses require co-assembly proteins. So then you need to code for an additional helper. I think my confusion is the number of proteins isn't the number of distinct proteins. Yeah, no, these are all identical. Number of proteins. These structures have six, this has 180 proteins. They're all identical, produced from the same gene. Oh, You're just copying it many times. That's. I mean, I, I saw those colors and I thought, well, there's at least three. Yeah, those are three because they're placed in different, not exactly in the same environment. That's why it's called quasi equivalent. But the bottom line is you have the same protein, you color it different because of the geometry, not because it's a different protein. It's structurally, they might be bent slightly different, but chemically, it's the same protein. Any questions from the students? Okay, uh, we can do right. this at Unica. Uh, we'll be Thank you. Enjoy.